To anyone coming across this video on YouTube, I'm actually posting this as the final and concluding lecture to Chapter 5's coverage from my biochemistry course, which talks about techniques in protein biochemistry. The reason I'm posting this is because while I was in class lecturing to my students, I wasn't completely able to finish this lecture, and I wanted to make sure that I gave them uh, access to the rest of this lecture prior to their taking the exam. So for those of you who watch this and think, where in the world is the first half of the lecture? Well, I'll get it up on YouTube eventually. With that said, let's go ahead and begin. So I was explaining to my students in lecture that if you take any protein you want, be it an enzyme or anything otherwise, and inject it into an animal such as a mouse, the mouse will begin producing antibodies against that protein because it sees that protein as an invader. You can then extract that animal's spleen and isolate the B cells that have developed antibodies that are specific to that particular protein. Once you have those antibodies, you can use them to identify and quantify that particular protein using a specific assay that I will talk about in just a moment. To begin, I want to throw at you a specific example. Let's pretend that you want to purify and quantify, which is a fancy word meaning numerically measure, estrogen receptor protein, or ERP, which happens to bind to the female steroid estradiol, whose structure is shown here. If you wanted to be able to measure the amount of ERP that a patient, for example, has in his or her blood, how would you go about doing that? Well, what you could do is take a mixture of this protein, probably by taking a, a blood sample from a patient, and you then put that solution in a test tube or something. Now, you should understand that ERP is a protein that binds very tightly and very specifically to this molecule, estradiol. What does that mean? Well, it means that if you have a solution, such as a patient's blood that has a bunch of ERP in it, and you throw in some estradiol, all of that ERP is going to get bound up or bind all of that estradiol. Make sense? OK. Well, what if you throw an estradiol that has been radio-labeled? When I say radio-labeled, what I'm talking is you can buy or synthesize estradiol that has at least one or more carbon-13 atoms in it. Well, carbon-13 atoms are very easy to see by using NMR spectroscopy. You can see them. So if you've done that, and you throw in a bunch of estradiol that's been carbon-13 labeled, that estradiol will bind to all of your ERP. So what do we do next? Well. Now we want to get rid of all of the initial impurities that might be present in that solution. So as I was kind of hinting at before, we'll centrifuge our mixture of proteins in a way that separates them according to mass, shape, and density. This technique is called gradient centrifugation and is covered in depth on pages 76 through 78 of our text, which I invite you, my students, to read. Ultimately, once again, this process separates the proteins from our original mixture, according to mass, shape, and density, into different test tubes like these. At this point, then, we'll just take a small amount out of each of these test tubes separately and then do carbon-13 NMR analysis with them. If we see any peak coming from any of these samples, that indicates the presence of carbon-13 labeled estradiol. Now, because we've washed away in the process of gradient centrifugation all of the free estradiol that might be around, the only estradiol that can be left has to be estradiol that is bound to ERP, which means that in that particular test tube or test tubes, there is ERP present, bound, of course, to C13 labeled estradiol. Whew, hope that makes sense. Anyway, the test tube, of course, is still going to contain a complex mixture of our desired protein along with probably tons of other impurities. I parenthetically have to mention, by the way, that most antibodies are Y-shaped and are sometimes drawn that way. That'll become important in the next slide. So, how do we purify, then, this crude mixture of ERP that we know has ERP because we've seen a peak on our carbon-13 NMR? Well, what we do is we take some antibodies, probably obtained from a mouse or a rat's B cells, that specifically bind to ERP. And we then stick those antibodies to the bottom of a plastic well like this. Now, the plastic well, by the way, is usually found in a 96 well plate, for which I've got a picture shown right here. So I have a bunch of these wells coated at the bottom with antibodies that are specific to ERP. That is, they're antibodies that bind to ERP and stick to it. What happens now is I take my crude mixture, my one in my test tube that I know has ERP, along with a bunch of other impurities, and I pour it into this well. In other words, we add our crude mixture, which contains our ERP and all of this other junk, into this well, as I've shown right here. 
You see those ERP molecules? They look like cute little pink circles. Now, because all of these antibodies that are stuck to the bottom of this well are specific to ERP, any ERP molecules that are floating around the solution will in turn bind to or stick to these antibodies, which are once again in turn attached to the bottom of the well. Now, in the original solution, any of the other things that are not ERP will not get stuck to these antibodies because, once again, these antibodies are specific to ERP molecules and won't bind to anything else. So I've got all this other free-floating garbage up here in the solution that I want to get rid of. What I'll do next is I take the well plate and I turn it upside down and pour off all of the liquid and wash it. And when I do so, anything that's inside that well that's not ERP stuck to an antibody that's stuck to the well will get washed away. That leaves me then pure ERP bound to antibodies bound to the well. Now at this point, we add a second batch of antibodies that are also specific to ERP, just like the antibodies that are attached to the bottom of the well. This second batch of antibodies, however, are slightly different from the first because they are pre-bound or labeled with an enzyme shown here is the capital letter E, that changes color when a certain substrate is added to it. Now, there are lots of different enzymes that do this, and which one you use will vary depending on the specific assay you're trying to do. Here's the point. I've got these antibodies that are specific to ERP attached to the bottom of a well. I've then stirred a bunch of ERP, which sticks to the top of these antibodies, and I then wash out all of the crap. I now introduce a second solution of these same antibodies except these ones have been attached to an enzyme that is a special glowy enzyme. We'll talk about that momentarily. As these are stirring around solution, these antibodies will attach to the top of these ERPs, forming sort of a little sandwich of antibody, ERP, antibody, with this capital E enzyme dangling off of the top. I hope that's all clear. If it's not, then please pause, replay this if you need to, pause and think about it until you can kind of get a grasp of what this is talking about. Now, once we have this cute little sandwich assembled, what we do next is we wash the solution to remove any of the unbound excess antibodies that are attached to this enzyme that might be floating around the solution. We get rid of all those. And then we add some substrate S to it. When E and S, this enzyme and substrate, stick together, it changes the solution's color. The greater the color change, the more enzyme there was in the original well. We can then use detectors that have the ability to determine by measuring the degree or extent of that color change the exact number of enzyme-bound molecules that were in the original sandwich. This can in turn be used to quantify or numerically measure the original amount of ERP. Now, this whole process for quantifying proteins that aren't enzymes is called an enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, or ELISA. Now, as you can see, ELISAs depend completely upon obtaining antibodies that are specific for the protein in question. Hence, it is the quintessential immunological technique for protein quantification. I now want to give you more details about antibodies and antigens. Foremost, as I mentioned earlier, actually, in lecture with you, antibodies that are specific for a desired protein are obtained from the B cells of various animals. There are a couple of additional details, however, that you should know. First, Animals' immune systems will often make many different types of antibodies that can bind to the proteins in question. These heterogeneous mixtures of multiple antibodies that all have the ability to bind to the protein that you've injected into the animal are called polyclonal antibodies and can be used for ELISA. Second, it's often desirable to have a pure single type of antibody to get better ELISA results. Such antibodies are called monoclonal antibodies and are obtained by purifying a solution of polyclonal antibodies. I really think this becomes relevant if you have the opportunity to work in a biotech company, which I did for three years as an undergraduate. Knowing this type of vocabulary before going in there can definitely help arm you uh, with a lot less ignorance than I had when I first started working my uh, first lab job. <laughs> Once we harvest B cells that make antibodies that are specific to our protein of interest, we still have to devise a way of ensuring that those B cells don't die in vitro shortly after being removed from the animal. You see, most B cells don't survive for very long after they're extracted from an organ. This is accomplished by incubating the B cells with cancerous multiple myeloma cells. Okay, as weird as this sounds, when placed in polyethylene glycol or PEG solution under the right conditions,
B cells actually amalgamate with myeloma cells to make new B cell myeloma cell hybrids, which are called hybridomas. Hybridomas have all of the properties of the original B cells. That is, they can make antibodies that are specific for our desired protein. However, they also have the immortality of multiple myeloma cells, which means that they can survive and multiply indefinitely in vitro if treated right. That is, they're essentially cancer cells. They don't die by apoptosis the way cells normally do. They are hybrids, then, of B cells and myeloma cells. In other words, hybridomas. Strictly speaking, hybridization is just the combining of two different things together. On that note, I'd like to show you a brief clip from one of my favorite comedians, Dimitri Martin, about hybridization, which starts at count 149 of the following YouTube video, to which I'll link right here. If you want to make an imaginary animal, if you want to make a mythical creature, just take a regular animal and add wings to it. Horse becomes Pegasus. A lion becomes a griffin. And a hawk becomes a double hawk. 